In this video, I'll provide an overview of key findings from the Mid-Atlantic Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. The Mid-Atlantic Assessment Area includes Pennsylvania, Southern New York, Delaware, New Jersey, and the eastern part of Maryland. The western part was included in the Central Appalachians Assessment. Within this region, there are six physiographic regions. There are not major differences between the five interior regions, but the coastal region experiences unique climate and developmental pressures that do set it apart. The assessment area has experienced substantial changes in temperature and precipitation over the last 100 years, and these observed trends help us understand potential future changes. Changes in temperature and precipitation were examined using PRISM data, which models historic measured data from weather stations onto a continuous grid. Long-term trends were calculated over 111 years from 1901 to 2011, because that was the available data at the time. This data tells us that the mean annual temperature of the Mid-Atlantic region has been increasing at an average rate of 0.16 degrees Fahrenheit per year. Over 111 years, this adds up to an overall increase of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. The small circles in this graph represent the mean annual temperature in a given year, while the blue line represents the rolling five-year average. The red line is an indication of the overall slope or the average temperature change throughout the 111 year period. You can see by looking at these dots that the temperature can increase by several degrees or decrease by several degrees from the average in any given year. Increases of a few degrees on average may seem small, but overall can result in big changes to the average severity of storms, the nature and timing of seasonal precipitation, and the frequency of drought and heat waves. Scientists have warned that an increase of one to two degrees is enough to disrupt sensitive ecosystems, and that temperature rises above 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will be very difficult for contemporary societies to cope with. Past climate data can also be visualized in a series of maps on which trends have been calculated with statistical significance. The stippled areas represent where trends have high confidence or less than 10% probability of being due to chance alone. Minimum and maximum temperatures are averages of daily lows and highs for the year. The mean temperature is the average of daily mean temperatures. A red arrow indicates when the average trend for the entire region is significant. In other words, minimum temperatures have increased by 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 100 years on average across the area, but the map shows that some places within the region have increased by as much as 6 or 7 degrees, while other places have not changed at all. Increases in maximum temperatures are concentrated on the eastern side of the Mid-Atlantic region. And looking at these trends by season will tell us even more. You might notice that there's a lot more orange on this map, showing us that winter temperatures are increasing faster than other seasons, especially minimum temperatures. Averaged across the whole assessment area, mean temperatures have warmed by 2.4 degrees, minimum temperatures have warmed by 2.6 degrees, and maximum temperatures have warmed by 2.2 degrees but some areas are responsible for much of that warming in the average. These areas have actually warmed by more than four degrees. And although I haven't shown the data here, I can tell you that most of that warming has occurred in February. There has been slightly less warming in spring overall, with large areas warming by one to two degrees as shown in yellow, and by three to four degrees in other places as shown in orange. Note here that the maximum temperatures have warmed faster than the minimum temperatures in spring, opposite what has occurred in winter. In summer, there has been a significant increase in minimum temperatures across the region, but with some locations literally in the red, with 5 to 7 degrees of warming. Interestingly, changes in maximum temperatures are similar for the coastal and Piedmont areas, but have cooled down in some areas by 2 to 3 degrees. 
Fall mean and minimum temperatures have been warming overall, less so than summer mean and minimum temperatures. Maximum temperatures again show a pattern of warming on the eastern side and cooling on the western side of the region. There has also been a shift in the rate of climate change beginning in 1970. The top map here shows that the mid-Atlantic states were relatively slow to warming over the last century, the 1912 to 2011 period. And they warmed up to two degrees overall, except for New Jersey, which warmed by up to four degrees. But since 1970, as seen in the bottom map, warming began accelerating everywhere, even in states that were already warming faster. The speed of warming across the lower eight, 48 states more than tripled, from 0 0.127 degrees Fahrenheit per decade to 0 0.435 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Other modeling efforts published in recent literature have identified trends in extreme temperatures. There have been fewer hot days and more cold days, which is the opposite of what you might expect. But also the difference between the warmest and the coldest temperatures are becoming more moderate. At the same time, the daily variability is increasing and the swing between high and low temperatures are more likely to occur immediately following one another rather than building up to it. There have also been fewer frost days, defined as those days below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and a longer growing season, which has increased by three to four weeks over the past century. Weather stations have also recorded precipitation over the past century. Across the whole region, total annual precipitation has increased by 4.4 inches, which represents an 11% increase. You can see by all the green that there is a widespread upward trend, except for the very eastern edge of New Jersey and the western edge of Pennsylvania, and a few other small dots. Significant increases range from four to six inches across most of the area, but up to 12 inches in some locations. Seasonal timing is especially important when we're talking about precipitation, because when the precipitation will come can be very important for natural ecosystems. In winter, there are some areas of minor increases in New York of one to three inches, or decreases of one to two inches in other places. But in terms of the percentage of overall rainfall, not a lot has changed in the last hundred years. Spring has received a little more precipitation in some areas by one to three inches, as well as this central blob where it has decreased by one to two inches. And there's been some summer intensification where it has become wetter in the northwest by one to two inches and drier in the south by two to four inches. But in fall, we see that precipitation has increased across the whole area and on average by 3.2 inches. Other published studies of observed precipitation in the region have found evidence for more days with heavy precipitation more very wet days, less consecutive dry days in some areas, and have linked the occurrence of one inch events to changes in temperature. In other words, rain events are getting bigger with longer dry spells between them. Observed sea level rise in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania has increased by 1.2 feet, which is significantly higher than the global average of eight inches over the past century, increasing the risk of impacts to critical urban infrastructure in low-lying areas. High ocean temperatures also contributed to the intense hurricane season last year. All 10 of the season's hurricanes occurred in a row and tied for the greatest number of consecutive hurricanes ever observed in the Atlantic Basin since records began in 1851. The amount of ice formed in the Arctic was near an all-time low last year and is linked to the increased likelihood of severe weather like the recent nor'easters in the past few winters. The theory is that warmer Arctic air is closer to the temperature in the lower latitudes and is weakening the atmospheric barrier that has previously kept the jet stream flowing in a relatively straight line. 
This river of air that speeds west to east around the globe now dips and wobbles north and south, and because the unleashed jet stream moves more slowly, weather systems tend to linger. For the entire northern hemisphere, there has been an increase in both the number and the strength of storms during colder months since 1950. And in particular, extremely heavy snowstorms have increased in number over the last century in the northern and eastern parts of the United States. Projected changes in temperature and precipitation across the assessment area were also examined this time using statistically downscaled climate data sets for three 30-year time periods over the next century, early, mid, and late century. Daily mean, maximum, and minimum temperatures and total daily precipitation were downscaled to an approximately 7.5 mile grid across the United States. For all climate projections, two GCM emission scenario combinations are reported, GFDLA1FI and PCMB1. These two climate scenarios represent the least amount of potential change and the most amount of potential change. The true future is likely to be somewhere in between. In the early part of the century, the difference between these two scenarios are very little, but they become more different as time goes on, with the GFDL A1FI scenario always predicting more change than PCMB1. Again, this information can be much more useful in map form. We can see that just like it past data, there are future hot spots or cold spots in some areas. We can also see that the warming will intensify through the end of the century. Under PCM B1, temperature is projected to change by an average of 2.2 degrees by the end of the century, while warming is much more rapid and severe under GFDL A1FI. Precipitation has more interesting temporal trends which show a dip and then a steady increase under PCM. Under GFDL, there is an increase followed by a return to almost normal before an increase. Total precipitation is projected to increase overall by 2.1 and 2.6 inches. Models agree that precipitation will increase in winter and spring, especially under GFDL. But models disagree about how precipitation will change in summer and fall. Under PCMB1, precipitation is projected to increase in summer and decrease slightly in the fall. Under GFDL A1FI, precipitation is projected to decrease substantially in the summer and increase slightly in the fall. Although there is quite a bit of uncertainty about the exact magnitude and timing of these changes, we can consider the potential implication of a slight to substantial decrease during summer or fall. The number of extremely hot days is projected to continue to increase through the end of the century. Summer temperatures are projected to continue rising and a potential reduction of soil moisture is projected for the region under GFDL, which exacerbates heat waves. Climate models project that the same summertime temperatures that ranked among the hottest 5% in 1950 to 1979 will occur at least 70% of the time by mid-century if global emissions of heat trapping gases continue to grow, as in the A1FI scenario. By the end of this century, what we have previously considered once in 20 year extreme heat events are projected to occur every two or three years over most of the nation. In other words, what now seems like an extremely hot day will become commonplace. And from increases in temperature and increased variability in precipitation, low water levels could occur earlier in spring and summer months, causing earlier droughts that persist longer into the growing season. High temperatures result in shorter, milder winters, and a shift from snowfall to rainfall in winter months will lead to changes in snow depth, snow hardiness, and rain on snow events. As the frequency and period of low stream flows increase, the stress for flora and fauna dependent on water levels and seasonal wetlands will also increase. 
Combined with more successive days of higher than normal temperatures, this will result in an increased cumulative heat stress, particularly in spring, summer, and fall. An increase in rainfall from heavy precipitation events is likely to lead to increased flooding and sediment, scouring, and delivery of nutrients and pollutants to aquatic habitats. So what does this mean for forests? One useful resource for understanding tree species responses is the Climate Change Tree Atlas. The Tree Atlas uses statistical relationships between forest inventory and analysis data, soils and topography, and climate to model current and projected changes in suitable habitat for 134 eastern tree species on a 20-kilometer grid. This particular map of black cherry shows a species that is projected to lose suitable habitat through the end of the century. The map on the left shows its current suitable habitat. Areas in green and blue have the most suitable habitat. Areas in yellow have less suitable habitat. Under the low emissions scenario in the mid-Atlantic region, we can see that we're losing areas of blue and dark green habitat. Under the high emissions scenario, all of the green and blue is gone, and we have very low importance value for this particular species. And here we have southern red oak, which is a species projected to increase through the end of the century. We can see under the current habitat that we're on the very margin of this species range. But under the low emissions scenario, suitable habitat starts to creep up into the mid-Atlantic region, barely seen here in the light yellow color. And under the high emissions scenario, we start to get some green in the mid-Atlantic region. And that yellow importance value creeps up all the way into New England. Remember that the Climate Change Tree Atlas modeled 134 species in the Mid-Atlantic region, and so there are many more species results available in the full vulnerability assessment. Here, I've just done a summary to show us the potential losers, winners, um, and those with new habitat being gained in the mid-Atlantic region by the end of the century. The potential losers include many of those boreal, northern, um, and conifer species that prefer cooler, wetter habitats. The potential winners include walnuts, oaks, hickories, and pines. In other words, those species that can tolerate warmer and drier conditions. New habitat is being projected for black hickory, cedar elm, laurel oak, and some others. How those species become established in the mid-Atlantic region is a separate question and will need to be addressed. Model results are mixed for cucumber tree, silver maple, sourwood, table mountain pine, and tulip tree. That means the model results indicate separate trajectories depending on the climate change scenario. And we dive into explanations of why that might be in the full vulnerability assessment. On forestadaptation.org slash species, we also have a series of individual tree species handouts for those six physiographic regions. These tree species handouts give lists for each tree species under the tree atlas and the Landis model and allow us to quickly compare and contrast which species might do better or worse. And again, those tree species handouts are available for all six regions in the Mid-Atlantic. These impact models give us useful information about individual species, but they're limited in how much they can tell us about how whole ecosystems may respond. Nor do they consider other factors such as extreme events or biological stressors such as insect pests and pathogens or deer herbivory. A big change for our forests may be longer growing seasons, especially with fall shifting later in the year. This change could lead to better growth and increased productivity, but changes in winter and spring temperature can lead to a loss of cold hardening or frost damages to the trees that put out leaves too soon. 
An increase in extreme storms, which models suggest may occur under warmer conditions, can lead to branch breakage or tree mortality. But there is a lot of uncertainty in exactly where, when, and to what extent this type of event will occur. Another big unknown is wildfire. This map is the result of estimating changes in fire probability based on future climate projections of temperature and precipitation. Future fire probability estimates increased in cooler northern and high elevation regions, including the mid-Atlantic. However, there are many other non-climate factors that affect fire and are often difficult to predict in the distant future, such as ignition sources, fire suppression, wind, fuels, and fragmentation. Biologic stressors may also interact with fire and each other to change the disturbance regime. For example, oak decline can be exacerbated under drought conditions, and invasive plants are well poised to adapt to changing conditions and take advantage of newly disturbed areas. We can combine this information with the results of the impact models to get a better understanding of the ecosystem vulnerability in the region. What do I mean by vulnerability? Vulnerability is defined as the function of a system's likely impact or the positive or negative effects on the system and its adaptive capacity or the system's ability to overcome those impacts or even take advantage of the new conditions. To assess vulnerability, we combine local information, forest impact models, a panel of experts to rate each ecosystem on its vulnerability. Each vulnerability rating is also given a confidence rating based on the amount of evidence available and the amount of agreement among that evidence. Putting it all together, we can explore the vulnerability rating for each forest type, as well as the reasons behind this rating. Maritime forests, for example, are rated highly vulnerable. They cover a relatively small area on the coastal plain, existing on barrier islands or in narrow bands near the estuaries, islands, and other coastal zones. The proximity of this forest community to ocean coasts means that changes in coastal dynamics, such as rising sea levels, more severe storm surges, and more frequent flooding, are greater drivers of species composition than changes in temperature and precipitation. Prolonged inundation with salt water may cause stress or mortality of trees, depending on the tolerance of individual species to salt and, and inundation. Salt tolerance is expected to influence how species respond to the changing environment. Salt tolerant species include pitch pine, red oak, white oak, black cherry, and eastern red cedar, and forests containing these species may be better able to tolerate future changes. Lowland conifers are another system rated with high vulnerability. Impacts on these forests are expected to be closely linked to site conditions related to hydrology, soils, and other factors. Although prolonged flooding may exceed the saturation tolerance of some species, an increased risk of drought is also a serious threat to many species. Reduced precipitation in the summer and fall may result in drier conditions, which can negatively affect rain-fed ecosystems. Tree susceptibility to insect infestations is expected to increase as trees become moisture stressed. Fewer than a dozen species make up this lowland conifer community, and most are projected to decline, including balsam fir, black ash, black spruce, eastern hemlock, and eastern red white pine. The physical structure and function of conifer communities create the shady, cool microclimates where they thrive, and there are relatively few native conifers to fill this functional role. As the keystone conifers decline, the identity, identity of this forest community may be severely compromised. Woodland glade and barren systems were rated with low vulnerability, partially because they already thrive in the hottest, driest, and most exposed sites, including the steep slopes of shale and limestone. Warmer, drier summers are likely to increase the risk of drought and fire in these locations, which could help maintain the open conditions on which they survive. However, longer and more extreme drought can delay germination or kill seedlings and mature trees. 
This community is characterized by fewer than a dozen species, which vary based on the presence of shale or limestone bedrock. Most of these dominant species are expected to increase or remain stable. We have time here to provide only three of the 11 summaries on 11 forest ecosystems. In general, across the region, temperatures have already been changing in the mid-Atlantic region to date and are expected to increase in the coming decades. Precipitation is increasing on average with more heavy rain events and that trend is expected to continue. However, summer or fall precipitation may decrease and combined with more precipitation falling as storms, as well as more evapotranspiration due to warmer temperatures, that can result in lower soil moisture available overall. A reduction in soil moisture and warmer temperatures may negatively impact conifers and northern hardwood species that rely on available moisture year round. Warmer temperatures may be beneficial to southern species like shortleaf pine and southern red oak. And also to note, the coastal maritime climate and changes in coastal dynamics will drive the unique species responses in the coastal plain. For more information, please find us online at www.forestadaptation.org. Thank you.